are you doing this? Ask questions, please. It really helps. No matter how bizarre they might be. I got one. Uh, yeah. Do you remember how long it took uh, to apply all of the makeup for when you became a zombie? Yeah, about an hour and a half. Well, that's all? Okay. Yeah, is Shavini on the panel? No. 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 Oh, okay, first. It's about an hour and a half, I remember. Uh, he didn't use uh, any prosthetic at all. Oh, okay. It was very simple. What he did was, and you can ask him, you know, he's in the room. Yep. Uh, is he put this solution on my face, and I think they're very thin kind of tissue, and then he will blow dry my face over and over and over. And dry, it kept shrinking, shrinking, and shrinking, and shrinking drinking and then simply put the makeup on top. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty clever, you know? Yeah. It's nice. It's pretty clever. Well, it was one of the most iconic scenes of any zombie movie when we came back. Yeah. That was just Oh it's it's still it's still things of legend. Oh you know, I mean even the re the remake will never touch it. Oh you no. know the way I love it. Even like, you know, the, the makeup the blue zombies. It's still something that resonates with me to this day. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Of course. So, you know, let's start off by, you know, a couple of house questions. So, what's one of your fondest memories that you have from back then? Fondest memories? Yeah, of anything that st sticks out from, like, on set incidences, bloopers, something funny that you can share with the, the group? Well, uh, okay, I don't know if it's funny, but um, you remember the scene earlier on when the zombies are down in the basement uh -huh. and they're all eating each other? Yeah. 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 Well, we were upstairs before we were called down to shoot. It was very cold, I remember that. And we came down stairs into this room, this cage, and you see all these zombies there eating legs, mm -hmm. eating each other, and in person, it looked really gross. Okay. It didn't look fake or anything. And I looked at George, I said, George, this is really disgusting. And he looked at me, he smiled. Like, yeah, I know. Awesome. He had a great sense of humor, Romero. Great sense of humor. Sir. Yep. Speaking of the remake, you had a cameo in it. Um, yeah. What was your experience on the remake? Oh, uh, it was very good. Um, Zach Snyder and Eric Newman, who Newman was the producer, uh, they were very receptive, very friendly, they were very grateful that we would come and do it. You know, and my attitude was, well, of course, you know, why, why not, you know. Uh, and uh, they couldn't have been nicer, frankly. And actually, Eric Newman was pretty funny. He was the producer, uh, you know, and I kind of take it all in stride, right? He was acting like a teenager to me, like a teenage fan. He's like 42 years old. So, wow, you know, I can't believe you're standing right here on the set. I said, Eric, thank you for having me, you know. And I just thought it was kind of remarkable. Sorry. Uh, they were very cool guys. Regardless of what you may or may not think about the movie, they were very cool guys. Oh, I actually had a question. Uh, for one of the scenes, scenes in the mall, you were actually sliding down. Sometimes it was the escalator. Yeah, was that actually improvised or did you actually put that in the script? Uh, it was not in the script. In the script, it said Roger runs down the escalator stairs. Oh, uh, gotcha. As far as I remember, it was just an idea that I had at the moment. Sometimes George would be very flexible, so we had an idea. I said, George, what if I slide down the middle? Okay. Anyway, what? He said, I can slide right down the middle as long as somebody catches me at the bottom so I don't break my back. And he went, okay, and he moved the camera. It was like one take. Oh, uh, cool. Let's, uh, let's Galen Ross. Hi. things that happened and, and, and what, my, one of my favorite moments was um, 
when we were in the mall and, and uh, all, everybody, you know, that was the moment when we were all going to kill all the zombies so that we could take over the mall. And, um, the nun zombie, if you remember, got caught in the penny store. And so I took up my gun to shoot it and George said, no, 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 you can't do that, it's a nun. <laughs> I, said, I said that she's dead because I know, but it's a nun. You have to let her go. George is Catholic. Yeah, very Catholic. <laughs> but it, I mean, there were some great moments. I mean, there was the the um, uh, the, the script was would constantly get changed uh, as as things were evolving. You would see things so. There was a place at, at a time where I thought the guys were getting too much of an advantage and they were leaving me in the dust. So I said, I, I need you to write something that gives her a little bit more strength. Because this was the time, before aliens even, before there were no women who were heroes. They were mostly screaming and, and fainting. So um, he, that's when he wrote the, the, the lines about it, I would have made you all breakfast, but I don't have my pots and pans, and I want to learn how to fly and shoot, and the guys are all eye-rolling, but George did it, you know, he was, you know, they were eye-rolling because that's how it portrayed. Yes, he, they didn't mean it. <laughs> well, Just for clarification. I, I love that because I came, that was like one of the first zombie or Well, I, George dubbed in a few screams. Okay. But in the, air, in the airport hangar where, you know, the zombie was trying to get David and me, um, I, I, didn't, I didn't, I said, George, I have to fly anything. In any case, I said, I'm not screaming, so I found that he put it in the screams at the post-production. I said, okay, <laughs> Apologize. I uh, I had all the intentions of getting here on time, and I saw Scott moving this way. Then Galen moved this, got up. She was headed out, and I told everybody, "I know where we're going. I'm, I'm all right. I head out. I headed for the full rock. Oh, oh, yeah. full rock. I went oh, uh, I turned and I turned. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> I met the four up ladies in the elevator. I said, aren't you closing? No, 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 no. I said, wait a minute. This is a panel. Where am I going to the panel? I, now I don't know. So here I'm here. I'm here. Hello, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Uh, glad to be here with my fellow actors. Wow, so, actor one. And super grateful that everybody's here. Love the movie. Still love the movie. Everybody loves the movie. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
they see me like, I'm not going to stay and watch this film. They have these people laugh and some laugh about the I thought it was going to be a terrible, terrible film. Well, I introduced it, and I started to leave, and I tried the door, and the door was not good, given it's locked. I said, oh, shit. So I came back. I sat down. He said, come on, kid. You can see you. And it was a nice, about 25 people in the audience, because it was a dinner affair. Right that thing. And I was amazed. I, it was, it was as if I had seen it, I was seeing it for the first time. I was amazed at how it captivated me, as it always does. If I spent five minutes watching it, all of a sudden I'm going to watch the entire film. I was uh, really taken by the performances of my co-stars. Co yeah. I um, have long, for, for I guess for 10 years, 20 years or more, have really gotten into when I see it, I watch their performances and what wonderful performances they all put in. They, they really, really brought it. And so um, I looked at it and said, God, this is as good as ever. It will never use, lose its legs. It will always be a great film. And this film, to this day, has been handed, from, handed down from generation to generation, from grandfather to father to grandson, all the way down to the line. Yeah. As a great, as a great film, and we have people who love it all over the world who just have been introduced to it in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. So it is, it, it, it never stops. So it's a, it's a great thing about this film. Well, so, well, well, getting into that, you know, let's switch the script a little bit. Did you have any creative inspirations in your character? I had no inspiration at all. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, it just seems like everybody has a little bit of a tip, you know. I'm, I'm well, yeah. Uh, you're asking about. Just to be clear with what you want me to add your character. As yeah. Your character oh, inspiration. Um, well, I have to. You know, I have to. I had to bring it to myself. I'm not a SWAT cop. I don't go around killing people. You know, but you got to bring the. Uh, Internally, what is happening with this character, with the guy, right. you know, and basically I just took an angle. Uh, how I approached it was that he was this, uh, he was this ex-SWAT cop, I mean, or former Marine, mm -hmm. who loved to live on the edge, and he thrived that way. Right. He thrived living in danger, right? Uh, and because he was an ex-Marine, he was a sharpshooter, and that he excelled in that world, not just a physical world, but in the dynamic and the danger and the level of edge. Unfortunately, his problem is that he takes too much for granted and thinks he can handle everything until he starts to unravel. I went, oh, that's an interesting thing for me to try to bring on forward. If that makes any sense. Yeah, no, very much so. Thank you. But, you know, I did a little research on you guys a little bit, you know, not too crazy, but you know, you you had a shot an ultimate ending, so was there any creativity as far as that goes as you know because uh, I don't believe that it all got released and whatnot, but that know. that that we were supposed to I was supposed to die, Cam was supposed to die. Yeah, we did shoot it. We did shoot the ending where I put my head in the front of a in the helicopter blade, and that was supposed to be the end, and then you're supposed to shoot yourself in the head, right, Ken? Uh, that's what they said. You didn't do it? No. But we shot my ending. With the head that ended up, I think they used it in the mall somewhat right. else that they blew up. But I mean, you know, I think the, the, the feeling was that George W. that was too too depressing, too dark. depressing. That that they couldn't do that. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, in, in Get Out, Jordan Peele changed his ending too. You know, that the, the guy was supposed to die at the end, which was totally logical that the cops would come and they'd see the, this guy, you know, in this white suburban neighborhood, and everybody dead, and they're going to shoot him. But you know, they decided that would not be good. <laughs> so well, it was his, cool. 
that. Yeah, so I think that's what happened, is that there's hope, but who knows what happened to them. I mean, I was driving a helicopter, so what are the odds? <laughs> right. No, that's wonderful. I mean, as far as your character, was there anything that you added on to spice things up a little bit, or was it just cut and dry as far as what you were doing? Like, they told you what to do, and... Are you talking to oh, me? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Who are you talking to me? Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were talking to the game. Well, no, to answer your question properly, so I... I talked to some friends who... <laughs> well, you know, so, I'm normally, you know, normally I'm sitting with them, so I feel like I'm kind of off to the side right now, you know. But, uh, you know, as far as your character goes, did you have any creative, did you just cut and dry, do what George said, or did you spice things up during the... You, you, you know, you, you read the script, the first time I read the script, I knew that there was a racial component to the woolly situation. Yeah what was going on in the first scenes. And I, I was a child or a, a person of the 70s, 60s and 70s, and so I'd been through some very uh, tumultuous times in the country. So at that point, I knew, and as I continued to read the script, I said, I'm the only black guy here. And I had to protect myself, and I didn't know where it was coming from. So, And I used a few individuals that were heroes for me as uh, when I grew up as well, you know, to give me to refer to. So I, I kind of tried to stay a, a little bit, I tried to keep my, I tried to grasp a sense of being in my own little box and protecting it all everything, protecting all sides of my body, right. anything coming my way. And I did that, and I started it before we arrived in Pittsburgh. I wanted to make sure that I had nothing to do with anybody except myself, and because I was responsible, would be responsible for just me. And I couldn't count on anybody else, because I saw no other, you know, and I heard the bully thing and all the stuff, and I said, kill them, kill those. Those ends and kill those S's and little blah blah blah. blah. I said, Oh boy, I said, okay, <laughs> this is not gonna work too well for me. You right. See, and then I then I said, you come down and I shoot Willie, and then all the guys point as you saw, they point the guns at me. Mm -hmm. I said, Oh, I'm going by myself here. So you know, I'm gonna take care of myself. Right. And, yeah, so that was one of the things. Including David. <laughs> Pointing guns at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Some, someone, 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 some, someone mentioned David today. And they said, David didn't shoot well. I said, did you see him run? Questions? You want to run any questions? The back, I want to say, don't you? Oh, yeah, stop. No, you can't run a good, good thing. The thing about David, uh, David was a Vietnam vet. Yeah. He full well knew how to handle a rifle. You know? <laughs> it was ironic. I wasn't a vet. I couldn't go. Uh, so it was ironic that he became the one who couldn't handle the rifle. <laughs> <laughs> also, you know, your question, really, I don't think I fully understand. Sure. You said, uh, did you have a lot of freedom? Yeah. I mean, yeah, tons of freedom. Okay. That, George, you have tons of freedom as an actor. Absolutely. Good. Yeah, you act on instinct and impulse when right. you're prepared. Well, I, we did a lot of that. We did a lot of that, God. It was, it was, I think that we had a, a freedom and a, and, and I, I don't know if the other actors felt that way, but there was kind of a connection of that we could, let's just go ahead and explore, do, yeah. see what happens, mm -hmm. let's just, do what we do and see if it works. Right. And we didn't say it. We I don't think I don't even think we thought it. I think we just reacted. And it was the right to right note. With the right note. Everybody as I said, I, I was astounded, astounded by the performances of my co-stars. Yeah. I really have been over the years. So Taking it all. you should give them a, a round of applause. Yeah. Get a couple questions, guy in the back. Oh, I was just gonna say, is George Romero hard or good to work with? I hated his guts. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, 
He's a pain in the ass every moment, man. I want to smack him. Oh, I think I hit him one night. <laughs> Come on, man. He's the best director I've ever worked with. Not just because he's George Romero, but because he is a decent human being, he is kind, he is respectful of everyone, no matter what your job is. And I'm, you probably have heard that about him, but it's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah, I would say, not, not, and he was generous. Generous. You know, it, it, it was funny as this guy who's making horror films, who's that, you know, the, it was the big bear, we used to call it, because he was like that, the big teddy bear. Um, but generous and kind and, 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 and very thoughtful, you know, mm -hmm. and you're talking about, you know, improvising or, or I mean, there were many times that um, I had an idea or, you know, and that George would never, like, do a, a strict directorial comment. He would never say, you know, take that and do the line. And he would never do that. And if, but if he didn't like something, he sort of, he would, there would be this slightest gesture. So you go, I think I better do it again, right? You better do it again. But he would never, ever um, be negative really about anything. But he would get what he wanted um, almost non-verbally. It was pretty, pretty, pretty amazing. I Can guess I some... Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, George would go around. Uh, I didn't never, never done a full feature before. Mm -hmm. um, and I heard him say NG sometimes <laughs> after a tape. Now, I was being really naive. I was like, you know, this classic theater guy. And I obsessed over that for two weeks when that night. There was some high tech film term. I finally figured it out, he meant no good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for the tape. Yeah, they, they have um, the directors that you work with that create a certain atmosphere on the set. And some for purposes of their own or because it's going to improve what they're the message of what they want, the way, the way they want the actors to go. They'll create a antagonistic, uh, they can be harsh, uh, all, all for purpose. Uh, they can, they can, I mean, Hitchcock was horrible to a lot of people. You know what I mean? I mean, they sometimes do that, but they have a purpose. They want to bring something out of it. George uh, was exactly what Galen said, you know, or what Scott said. Uh, and that was uh, basically who he was. So he always had a, a soft and gentle approach to his direction and to his command of the, of the set. So he was always, you know, it was, it was a pleasure to work with him. And it was almost as if you were working with someone that you were a friend or as a buddy instead of someone who was in, you know, position of power, you know. So. That's how it was before. And, and I would add, you know, that what for the crew as well. I mean, never seen a crew that would, you know, ask uh, on their own, what else can we do? How many more hours can we work? How much, you know, but they never had, George never had to say, you know, I need more and negotiate. It was like the crew, all the crew was ready to do whatever George needed and more. And, um, that was that's pretty incredible on a film set, and I would add, you know, when I worked with George on Creep Show too, there were actors there who were really, you know, had histories like Fritz Weaver and Carrie Nine, E.G. Marshall, who worked with the best of them, and they were hesitant about working with George. They didn't know who he was, and they thought this was horror, and they, and uh, all of them, every one of them were so full of admiration and respect for George and the way he treated them as, as legends. I mean, E.G. Marshall is a legend. And they felt that they, they were able to perform on, in the film the way they wanted, and they were respected, and they adored working with them. This film is very strange. It has, I, and I just noticed last time I was in Pittsburgh, I was there in June or something, Monroe Bill Mall. The zombies, yeah. they, you know, 
there are zombies who have made a career <laughs> out, of this, out of this film. You know, I mean, they've traveled everywhere. I mean, they're, and uh, it was surprising. I was walking through, going to a photo op, and I'm walking through one of the uh, storefronts that they use for it, and they have a lot of the zombies, or some of whom, whom I knew. This one guy <laughs> grabbed me and said, Ken, 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 take a picture with me. And I said, oh, sure, sure, sure. He said, see, you knocked me out. <laughs> and he had this big poster with a shot of him and me, and he was getting punched by me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, gee, and, 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 some of us, and then I, I read some advertisements. Um, I come visit uh, this shop it's in Monroeville or in Pennsylvania or Pittsburgh or something because Jojo -Jo -ba 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 is going to, is, is the zombie who did uh, is a period. <laughs> you know, so they did almost all of the people who were in this film who were zombies or had bit roles in it. They have yeah. a sense of stardom or celebrity because of this film. And, it's, and some of them have traveled almost as much as, as I have in terms of going out and publicize. I mean, there's a, the nurse zombie, the Hare Krishna zombie, <laughs> and, uh, there's several the people. Helicopter zombie. The one in Night of the Living Dead, uh, what's his name? Heisman. Who, Bill Heisman, who, who was the zombie in the cemetery, he used to dress up in, his, in a cemetery suit and with the green up, and he would appear at all the conventions. And he was, until he died, that's what he did. And a, and a lot of them still do. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's a phenomenal, it is a phen I think Dawn of the Dead happened at the right time and the right moment in history. I think that at that point, with the gore, the color, uh, technicolor, and the gore, and the time that it happened, Roland Barrett, uh, Cisco Ebert, uh, Gene Shallot, Rex Reed, all of those people gave a thumbs up. The stand of some major reviews in the country. The, 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 it, it, it stayed at number one, number two, and number three, the first three weeks of of both sales in variety. Mm -hmm. This film exploded. Remember, do you guys remember, I was going to ask you guys. We got a rating. Do, do you remember? We yeah. got a rating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that when we went to that, that press conference on Fifth Avenue at that hotel, mm -hmm. and there were um, 75 to 100 people there, and including Rex Reed and all those other guys, and we're sitting there saying, God, what the hell? You know, so it just... It, uh, but it, I would also say that, you know, the, the reviewers like Rex Reed and, and Ebert, they, the critics loved it, yeah. and the audiences loved it, but it was still, and it was unrated. Yeah. So that meant yeah. that a lot of theaters couldn't show it or it couldn't be advertised in certain ways. There were, it was a time, I think, there were a few other films that came out unrated that yeah. I think, were, I can't remember, but there were a number of them. But it was still a horror film, so it was marginalized. So when I remember when you know we would go to agents and look for work, and they go, well, "What was your last job?" and they would say, "Dawn of the Dead." They go, "Yeah, yeah, but what film? Did, what real film?" Did <laughs> yeah. And it, you know, they they did that wasn't. Oh yeah, horror. That was that was a horror film. Horror was still a very strange right. genre. So. Yeah. And, and I would say, so, so it took quite a while for this to become the classic that we know, because at the time it wasn't. And for George, it was also interesting too, because when he wanted to break out of horror, when he did Night Riders, you know, and that was his dream film, you know, which was his vision of what the world should be in Camelot, <laughs> and at Harris, was, you know, it was his first big film, right? And yep. He, yeah. Right. Um, he found that Harris had a little off off theater somewhere in LA. Oh, in, oh, in, yeah. in, in Los Angeles. Yeah. Yes. So that was his dream film, you know, to do the, the vision of the world that he Eminem, wanted. And, and, um, and he was incredibly disappointed that, you know, audience didn't go because they wanted George and Horror again. So it was, a, it was a time, it took a while for Dawn to become Dawn. 
Right. You know? I, I lost friends. <laughs> <laughs> I had I had friends who, who were in, who were who were in my acting class. I had friends, my acting teacher. <laughs> um, um, I had I, I had people come. I had during we, we had a screening number in, in New York, a first screening yeah. where we went to a restaurant right afterwards. One no, good no, no, no. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I went in there, a woman from the New York Times came and cornered me. I had a date with me and you know, a few people sitting with me. And she said, How does I'm from the New York Times and I how does it feel killing children? Oh, oh man. Yes. Oh. I had another friend who, who, I, who I knew. <laughs> who I knew. I said, I said, this, this is a, I said, it's a movie. It's spelled as fantasy. But I, I had another friend who said, you were in that movie. Uh -huh. And others said that didn't speak to me at all after that. You understand? Uh, my acting teacher said, I don't think I'll be able to see your, your, your real acting ability in this film. <laughs> you know? He was right. <laughs> but, but still, I lost a lot of credit. It was, it was not, as Galen said, it was not taken, it was kind of, as we said, 1968 was Night of the Living Dead. Nothing between that and Dawn that really shocked the American psyche. And then this came. And they still had a pushback about, oh, this belongs over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. said, this belongs somewhere else. And the Cisco and Ebert and, and, and Walter Baird and the Tree said, we give it a thumbs up and you should go see it if you like this kind of film. We're not going to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> you go see it. And so, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. You've been waiting patiently. So yeah. Go ahead, Rob. You just said that. How did they pitch it to you? Did they pitch it as a continuation of Night of the Living Dead to you as it was going? Yeah. Not at all? Just another horror film? No, but I knew Dwayne Jones. Dwayne Jones and I were friends. We were in the same activist group in New York. I saw him twice a week, if not more. Uh, I saw him when, when Night of the Living Dead came out. I saw his picture in the lobby, so passing the movie theater in the, in the marquee, in the markets and the lobby cards, and I ran to our place where we meet, and I said, Tony, you're in the movie? He said, shh. It's all over the damn city, man. <laughs> and so I, I knew, I knew Dwayne, I knew about the film, I was a fan of the film. Uh, I was a fan of the film, maybe not only because of Dwayne, because I, I just was amazed that I could look at a film that was that low budget and still be captivated by it. And I mean, when they reached into that burning car, pulled out the guests and started eating, I said, oh, this is way off the table for me. And that was the beginning. But I said, I like it. Mm. I'm staying, and I stayed with it. And I liked the ending. I was, I was kind of hurt by the ending, but yes. I liked the ending. And I was kind of hooked. So I never heard anything from George or Richard. Even when we walked in, in the room for the audition with the Richard's office, there was, a, there was a poster for Night of the Living Dead and Eraserhead and all that stuff in it. I didn't pay that much attention to it. I, to, I went in just to read an audition. So we never yeah. talked about it really. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, as far as I'm concerned, you guys set the case. I mean, we wouldn't be where we're at right now if it wasn't for that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Quick guy in the back and the hat, and I'll take you next. Okay. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a classic, but it, as dated as it, it is, I try to introduce the movie to kids now, and they roll their eyes at some of the you know, technology and stuff. But yeah. they get into it. it. It's based enough to them, and they they absolutely love it. And yeah. people need to, to keep introducing it to the newer generation before it, 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 it dies it, out. And they, all, they always ask, what, what happened to Peter and Blanche? What did they go? I wrote that. <laughs> I, I, I have that in script. I wrote that. But <laughs> never mind. <laughs> but, but you're right. It's, it, 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 that's exactly.
That's it. No, no, no. I said, okay. he said, he said, what happened to your like the, oh. the, our characters? Oh. Oh. I said I wrote a script about it. But, but you're <laughs> absolutely right. It doesn't. It, it is passed on, and if they watch it, they enjoy it, no matter what the generation. I don't know why, but it's, it works. It continues well, to work. I'd like to do one thing before we leave. It. Yeah, I want to take one well, more question. I, I, okay. I wanted to say something before you. Sure. Sure. No, I wanted to say the last thing before we get out. So you oh, go. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, you know, Museum of Modern Art in New York is having a whole summer. They decided to do all their films this summer on horror, women in horror, black horror, and they're making a whole season for horror films. I mean, they're getting audiences and kids into that museum that never saw that museum before. And they're thinking, right. how do they keep them in, lock the doors? But the one film that they opened with the whole season was Dawn of the Dead in 3D. And there we were at MoMA, you know, this amazing theater and sold out with, you know, young people there. And, you know, the thing is, okay, the 3D, you know, stuff comes at you a few times, and even I jump, blood is coming at you from the air. But the, um, I think the humor, you know, we, the effects are no longer as sophisticated as the effects are now, and, you know, you know, and, but the humor and the characters and what happens and the tension and the drama of closing the doors in the mall, it all stays. It's all there. It's just different. But you get involved in the stories, of the, you know, and I, the, you know, you have people were laughing with the zombies and the escalator and the pie fight, and, you know, and even the biggest laugh was when, the biggest laugh was when I refused David's um, proposal. That is not the right time. No. We'll get you on that question real quick. Oh yeah, I was going to ask you guys. I'm looking back on it. What was like the weirdest store? The weirdest store. So you guys actually shot at in the mall. You guys were the weirdest store. Yeah. Or just like, oh, this is a really bizarre store to shoot to kill zombies in or whatever. Gee. They're all fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was. I probably, probably the, one of the more active scenes is when we're in the car, you know, and uh, we're dragging the zombie, then we're shooting at him. We, we're first still in the car. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in the mall. I think that's uh, that was a little weird. You know, we had to be very careful with that car driving through the mall. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so Dawn of the Dead, I honestly believe, is one of the, it's the best zombie movie ever made. And in popular culture, uh, I'm just curious, have you guys seen Shaun of the Dead? That oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah. so to be, to be, you influenced Edgar Wright, Simon Pegg, who are yeah. huge stars, and they, they love you guys. Yeah. Well, they love George. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, but, and George loved Shaun of the Dead. Yeah. yeah. Loved. I'm just curious. Dynamite yeah. movie. Uh, of course I loved it. Absolutely, yeah. without a doubt. That was a real homage to George. Funny yeah. story about that, though. Like, we and my wife met, you know, and we started getting on, and I, <laughs> I asked her what her favorite movie was. And we shot it at that, and now we're married. But no, thank you guys very much. Like Let, I said, let me say this sure, 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 sure. um, Again, before we go, please. Ah, God. Give a hand to these two. Oh, I know